Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, August the 4th. Again, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long, an attacker opposes me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Our New Testament reading tonight is a continuation of the story of Paul uh, in Acts chapter 27. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sa sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship, and when they had eaten enough, they had lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat unto the sea. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and led them into the sea, at the same time loosening the, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept him from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or pieces of the ship, and so it was that they were all brought safely to land. And our Book of Concord reading is the second part of Article 27 on monastic vows. In the second place, why do our adversaries exaggerate the obligation or effect of a vow when, at the same time, they do not have anything to say about the nature of the vow itself? 
A vow should be something that is possible. It should be a decision that is made freely and after careful deliberation. We all know how possible perpetual chastity actually is in reality, and just how few people actually do take this vow freely and deliberately. Young women and men, before they are able to make their own decision about this, are persuaded, and sometimes even forced, to take the vow of chastity. Therefore, it is not fair to insist so rigorously on the obligation. Everyone knows that taking a vow that is not made freely and deliberately is against the very nature of a true vow. Most canonical laws overturn vows made before the age of 15. Before that age, a person does not seem able to make a wise judgment and to decide to make a lifelong commitment like this. There is another canon law that adds even more years to this limit, showing that the vow of chastity should not be made below before the age of 18. So which of these two canon laws should we follow? Most people leaving the monastery have a valid excuse, since they took their vows before they were 15 or 18. Finally, even though it might be possible to condemn a person who breaks a vow, it does not follow that it is right to dissolve such a person's marriage. Augustine denies that they ought to be dissolved. Augustine's authority should not be taken lightly, even though some wish to do so today. Although it appears that God's command about marriage Although it appears that God's command about marriage delivers many from their vows, our teachers introduce another argument about vows to show that they are void. Every service of God established and chosen by people to merit justification and grace without God's commandment is wicked. For Christ says in Matthew 15, 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Paul teaches everywhere that righteousness is not to be sought in self-chosen practices and acts of worship devised by people. Righteousness comes by faith to those who believe that they are received by God's grace for Christ's sake. It is clear for all to see that the monks have taught that services made up by people make satisfaction for sins and merit grace and justification. What else is this than detracting from Christ's glory and hiding and denying the righteousness that comes through faith? Therefore, it follows that monastic vows which have been widely taken are wicked services of God and consequently are void. For a wicked vow taken against God's commandments is not valid for, as the canon says, no vow ought to bind people to wickedness. Paul says, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Galatians 5.4 Therefore, anyone wanting to be justified by his vows makes Christ useless and falls from grace. Anyone who tries to connect justification to monastic vows bases his justification on his own works, which properly belongs to Christ's glory. It cannot be denied that the monks have taught that they are that that they were justified and merited forgiveness of sins by means of their vows and observances. Indeed, they even invented greater absurdities, saying that they could give others a share in their works. If anyone wanted to make sure of this point, to make our opponents look even worse, even more things could be mentioned, things that even the monks are ashamed of now. And on top of all this, the monks persuaded people that the services that they invented were a state of Christian perfection. What else is there other than assigning our justification to works? It is no light offense in the church to set before the people a service invented by people without God's commandment, and then to teach them that such service justifies. For the righteousness of faith, which ought to be the highest teaching in the church, is hidden when these wonderful and angelic forms of worship, with their show of poverty, humility, and celibacy, are put in front of people. God's precepts and God's true service are hidden when people hear that only monks are in a state of perfection. True Christian perfection is to fear God from the heart, to have great faith, and to trust that for Christ's sake we have a God who has been reconciled, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. It means to ask for and expect from God his help in all things with confident assurance that we are to live according to our calling in life being diligent in outward good works, serving in our calling. This is where true perfection and true service of God is to be found. 
It does not consist in celibacy or in beginning or in begging or in degrading clothes. The people come up with all sorts of harmful opinions based on the false praise of monastic life. They hear celibacy praised without measure and feel guilty about living in marriage. They hear that only beggars are perfect, and so they keep their possessions and do business with guilty consciences. They hear that it is even they hear that it is an even higher work, a gospel counsel not to seek revenge. So some in private life are not afraid to take to take revenge, for they hear that it is but a counsel and not a commandment. Others come to the conclusion that a Christian cannot rightly hold a civil office or be ruler. There are, on record, examples of men who hid themselves in monasteries because they wanted to forsake marriage and participation in society. They called this fleeing from the world and said that they were seeking a kind of life that would be more pleasing to God. They did not realize that God ought to be served according to the commandments that he himself has given, not in commandments made up by people. Only a life that has God's commandment is good and perfect. It is necessary to teach the people about these things. Before our times, Garrison rebukes the monk's error about perfection. He testifies that in his day it was a new saying that the monastic life is a state of perfection. So many wicked opinions are inherent in monastic vows that they justify that they cause Christian perfection, that they make it possible to keep the counsels and commandments, that they are works over and above God's commandments. All these things are false and empty. They make monastic vows null and void. And tomorrow evening we'll continue with the Augsburg Confession with Article 28 on church authority. And it's going to be Article 28, Part one of possibly three, because that is the last article, and it's very long. So we, we'll divide it up into two or possibly three sections. We join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your faithful, your fathomless mercy with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time. For behold, the evil one has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, Strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war, held as slaves in sacrifices of earthly wrath, may return to their home. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness, and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your Son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace that we may withstand all trials 
and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.